This might be a difficult question just because the program's in a good place. It hasn't reached the goals that I'm sure Dan Mullen has, but um, at the same time, off to a great start where I talk to a number of folks like you and, and the easy answer is get rid of the coach or the offensive coordinator or somebody. But if you could make any change to Florida football and, and you can go to fight songs or uniforms or anything you could possibly think of, is there anything that you would change about Florida football? Right now, actually, the big talking point around Florida football is recruiting because they just lost out on Demarcus Bowman. Um, he's a running back out of Lakeland, and he chose to go to Clemson. Um, Florida was really heavily involved in this recruitment. It's no secret they wanted him. He was the number one target at running back, and they lost it. They lost him to Clemson. They're, you can't really say face about this. They lost him to Clemson. They didn't. They didn't say, okay, this is a guy that we want. No, no. They really wanted and they really needed him. So, so this is something that conversation that many people have had with Dan Mullen from his days from Mississippi State, where he was a great coach. He's a great developer of talent but he's probably not the best coach when it comes to recruiting. Um, I think he's done a good job at Florida bringing the pieces that he needed in the last two seasons. Um, But I think he can get better. This is not, not being entirely negative here. I know some fans will be pretty angry about this, thinking that Damon has done a good job, but at the same time, you can't let a kid from Lakeland lead the state. You're, you really need to do a better job in that. And that's something that Dan Mullen hasn't done yet. I'm not saying he can't. Again, this is only his second um, season coming up. So he does have time. But I do think he probably needs a little stronger recruiters on the staff. Um, he's done a good job of seeing that he needs changes in that recruiting room. And he has done those changes during the last few months. He brought on two extra guys for that recruiting office. He's changed um, a couple guys, some guys have left. So I think he realizes he needs some better guys on that recruiting staff, secondary staff. So he's moving in the right direction, but you need to keep those in-state kids in-state. You need to keep DeMarcus Bowman in-state. You can't have him leave the state. Those are the type of guys that will change a program around for you. I got to say, Jackie, I'm surprised by the answer, uh, but that is uh, something that you certainly have the pulse on, so I will take it. Uh, if Florida truly wants to be elite, uh, there, there is, there is a level of, you're going to be winning nine and 10 games a year and you're going to recruit in the top 15 and you're going to be fine. But then there's a, just really let's kick it into gear. And, uh, you got Georgia, Alabama, Ohio state, Clemson at that level, recruiting at that level. And, uh, that's certainly what most Florida fans want to aspire to. And that's a whole yeah. other, yeah. Getting those four or five kids each recruit recruiting class that make a difference. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I'm not focusing on stars at all. When I, when I say this, it's basically DeMarcus Bowman was their number one target running back. Um, so what I'm saying is I'm not saying focus on the five stars you're going after or four stars. I'm not talking about stars. I'm talking about you're on Florida's board. You need to make sure that that number one target stays in state if that's the guy that you're going after. I think that's the priority here. I'm not talking about five or four stars. Sometimes those pan out. Sometimes they don't. Most of the time they do pan out. But with Florida, that was the number one guy. And that was a really big get for them, regardless of position as well. So that's why that's something that kind of was like, okay, Clemson came into the state and got him. Um, And I know a lot of people compare Debo Sweeney's time at Clemson, how he hasn't finished um, like in a top five of a recruiting class. He was able to get national championships. But then you compare the ACC to the SEC. Um, That's a whole different ballgame. Don't get me wrong. Clemson was able to beat Alabama. But their journey to getting in that position is a lot easier than a Florida trying to get into that position. So you can't really compare what Clemson has done in their recruiting and how what and how they were able to accomplish getting into the college playoffs with how Florida will have to. Don't forget, they need to get over and they need to win against Georgia um, to even get into the conversation of getting into college playoffs because they're not going to get into college playoffs if they don't make it to the SEC championship game. So I think that's where you can't really complain. We're really compare what Clemson has done on the recruiting trail to what Florida has done previously with Debo Sweeney because Debo Sweeney is doing a good job now with the recruiting class, but that wasn't all always the case during his tenure at Clemson, especially in the beginning. Yeah. It's the only conference in college football where on both sides, you've got just mammoth, uh, massive barriers to get to the conference championship game. Unlike yes, Clemson, nobody in their way, Ohio state, uh, a little bit of resistance, but nothing close to again, uh, every year that, <laughs> Alabama, LSU, Auburn, Texas A&M, Log Jam, Florida, Georgia um, in the SEC Eastern Division. 
Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking it down with uh, Jackie Franchuli from uh, Gators Territory. So this is another difficult lift for you because this is not an obvious answer as well and a difficult mm -hmm. answer to make because the SEC is riding high. But is there anything about SEC football that you would change? Um, the only thing that comes to mind is the scheduling. Um, I, I, although I've been in the SEC for the last few years, I also have been in the ACC, um, and I've covered, you know, the big 10 as well. And I feel like sometimes those other conferences get knocked a little bit for their scheduling, but at the same time at the SEC, like an Alabama doesn't play non-conference road games as much as the, or, or the other um, programs or the other programs play more conference games than the SEC does. Like the B Big Ten schedule, um, I, I just, you know, the, I mean, Alabama played Citadel. Um, so I think that's when I think like SEC's schedule when it comes to non conference may be a little bit tougher. Um, that could be. But again, you're also, you can also argue that the SEC schedule in general is tough. So that's why you have these other games. So um, that's the only thing that I would possibly change is how the SEC scan schedule is kind of organized at the moment. You're playing right into my hands. That's, that's, <laughs> I bring that up all the time. That's, that's one of my <laughs> calling card arguments right there. I, I just think that the whole thing should be brought under one committee, one formula. I've laid out the formula. I'm not going to bore you with it, but it would ensure <laughs> It would ensure, and people liken it to an NFL system every time I explain it, and it's not mm -hmm. the NFL. The NFL is trying to create parity, so they give the better teams tougher schedules and the worst teams easier schedules, just like the NFL draft, the way it's ordered. I'm not trying to create parity. I'm trying to create fairness, um, yes. and you can't project how good teams are going to be that particular season, but if you base the non-conference schedule on the previous year's records, you're going to get much closer to that, and you force teams to play, and you take it out of the particular programs hands in scheduling these games 14 years in advance. And I, I don't see why a schedule can't be built every off season. It's done in every sport that are much more complicated than college football. Um, and then, yes, uh, I would like to see some teams travel and not uh, somebody raised the question to me, when is the last time Florida went out of state for a non-conference game? And uh, I, I didn't come up with that answer. I, I didn't look it it's up, but I know it's been it forever. Yeah, um, it's been a long time. Uh, I'm trying to think, actually, if it's been within the last 10 years. And I don't think it's been in the last 10 years where they've uh, left the state for a non-conference game. For an actual road game. Yes, yeah. for the road game. So, but yeah, I, I always argue that scheduling, especially now when I was in the ACC before covering that conference, that was something when, um, you know, obviously I covered Florida State's national championship run when I covered the ACC. And when I covered that one, they always said that the ACC – schedule helped florida state but at the same time I'm like well the sec didn't play a lot of non-conference road games so it's you can't it's really hard to compare conference schedules when you can't knock a team for being perfect in their own conference um but then say that you know an sec team has lost two games but that schedule is a little tougher it's so hard to compare but maybe you can have a uniformity of how these schedules are worked or maybe have share a couple of you know non-conference games so you really get a good bearing on how um these teams are when you're up against each other but that goes into my i think uh, one of the other things you're going to bring up is like how college football can change and that brings up college football playoffs and how they decide on those teams yeah, uh, just look at last year. Pitt of all teams, marginal team. I know they went to the ACC championship game, but they lost seven games. They weren't a good team. They were a marginal team, but they went out and played Penn State, Notre Dame, and Central Florida in their non-conference schedule. Uh, mm -hmm. This year, Stanford's playing Central Florida, Notre Dame, and Northwestern. It's crazy. It, it is, and you know, and then when you look at some of the SEC schedules, you're like, you, you know, you're thinking like you're playing D2, D3 schools. You're, you're playing, the, these guys are going to be completely, they're, they're cupcakes. Um, so that is where it, I, I feel like the SEC can change because that is a knock on the, on, the, on the conference. And then when you have the college playoff system and how it's worked, it could be a knock for a second SEC team to make it into the college playoffs. Absolutely. And uh, defenders of Alabama have said that they didn't know that uh, they were, that Louisville was going to be lousy last year and Duke was not necessarily most likely going to be a really good team this year. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Louisville is basically a seven and five, eight and four team in its, in its heyday in its good years. 
So yes. that's not who Alabama should be playing. And Duke is Duke. So whether you're scheduling it to, for the next year or 10 years from now, you know, you know, you're not, you know, if you catch Ohio State or Oklahoma on a down year, okay, we'll not fault that or Florida State a few years ago, like Alabama did. But scheduling mm -hmm. Duke and Louisville is not the answer to tough non conference scheduling. All right, Jackie. No, yeah, okay. we'll uh, bring it from the SEC to, uh, the national scene and whatever you'd like to change there. Well, I think I hinted it already, Mark, but I do not like how the college playoff system is working right now. Um, I don't think it's fair in all honesty. I think there are a lot of teams that are left off the college playoffs that have won their conference championships. And um, I, I think the way you do it is if you, you got to ex expand it. Um, I, I just don't see how there's any fairness into the system right now, because although before there was a lot of computer models, I hated the BCS version as well. Like I, I wasn't a fan of all the computers kind of deciding it, but at the same time, now you have humans deciding, you have human error. Um, and when they have, you know, I know there's no clear biases, but you also are human. You have some clear biases when you go in there just by being human. I will have some biases when I, have obviously when I when I go somewhere and if I have an opinion on something I'm going to stick to my guns on that opinion no matter what it is um and that's something that other humans do as well and I think that's something that you know if you have a preconceived notion that this conference is stronger than this conference then obviously you're going to have a little more leeway to this conference so I think if a team wins their conference championship they should have a little bit more of an edge when it comes to the college football playoff and how they decide and I don't think that's the case right now um, it's been proven that's not the case with how the Big Ten has been left out of the college football playoffs. So, and I think when it comes to college football playoffs and the, and the Big Ten, I feel like, I feel really bad for the Big Ten because some of these have really, really tough schedules and tough road games compared to some of the other programs that have made it in the college football playoffs. So um, I think that needs to be discussed a little bit and expanded. I don't know how that's going to make it work because obviously they're going to add more games to the postseason. Um, and that's something that, you know, coaches will not like. So it's, it's, it's something where maybe, you know, we get rid of the conference championship. So that's something that you're worried about because what is the point of playing in a conference championship if the winner will not get into the college playoffs? What's the point if they're just going to automatically go to somebody else? Um, so that, that's the question that I have is why are we playing in the conference championship if it doesn't relate to anything in the college football playoffs? Or how about those guys that win the conference championship have an automatic bid to the college football playoffs. Bingo. I couldn't have said it better. I've said it many times, but uh, that was succinctly stated. Uh, I know it sounds ridiculous, but if the conference championships don't matter, then just uh, let's have 64 teams. I think that's the number of power five. Just, just line them up, number them one through 64, and they can just randomly play each other in some kind of randomizer. And that's the schedule. Because if the conference doesn't matter, then... Uh, these conferences play generally in a vacuum because of our previous conversation, because of the lack of overlap of games against each other. And now yeah. we're trying to judge and evaluate teams that don't have any overlap in schedule. And uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and then I have people that tell me, well, you're going to water down the field and water down the regular season if you go to eight teams. Well, come on. Nobody has an issue with the NFL, Major League Baseball, these other where 35 to 50 percent of the teams make the uh, playoffs. Eight out of 130 would make the playoffs. We're still looking at like five to six percent of the field. And exactly. uh, I've heard people mention, OK, well, if the eighth best team in the country wins the national championship, uh, that kind of uh, taints the regular season. Well, first of all, if they're the eighth best team in the country, after uh with 130 teams there's nothing wrong with that uh secondly i guess they weren't the eighth best team in the country if they if they beat three of the top seven teams in the country if that's not earning a national title beating three of the top seven three consecutive weeks and then they must not have we must have misevaluated them as the eighth best team to start the uh the whole tournament so i think it's silly I think so too. And if they, uh, what I always think it's ironic is these people love March Madness. They love the basketball NCAA tournament where there are a lot of upsets that happen. Um, we, we saw, you know, last year when Virginia lost to the number 16 team for the first time in history, it happened. 
happens. Upsets happen in tournaments. That's why I love playoffs. That's why I love tournaments because upsets can happen in those situations. And also, I love football because sometimes it's about mismatches. Sometimes when you when you play two teams, sometimes it's not even about what stars they have on the team. It's about matchups. And sometimes, you know, I remember uh, Georgia Tech and Florida State in that ACC championship game. Florida State sneaked past Georgia Tech, but I always was telling everybody that Georgia Tech's um, triple option was going to be a problem for Florida State because they don't face that that often. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a closer game than what me, many people thought because of the way Georgia Tech plays and Florida State doesn't have the players to match up with that. Um, and I think that's what's so much fun when you have an eight team college playoffs because you will see those matchups because they don't play against some of these teams often. So they don't, you know, have the players to face off to that system because when you're in the SEC, SEC East, you know which teams you're going to face off. So you're going to recruit players that will face those current system that will fit your system. But, you know, um, obviously Georgia Tech won't have a triple option now with Jeff Collins, but previously, you know, a team outside the ACC that will face Georgia Tech, they will be completely bewildered because they don't face that often. Um, so I think I like the fact that if you do have a extent in college playoffs, you also have those matchups where you don't see every day. So I think it'll be fun to see those type of games like that. Yeah. If you look at the NFL, there are teams that get left out of the playoffs that have maybe the same record as a team that made the playoffs, but they have a system that differentiates those two teams and their resumes. That's systematic. Uh, and they play so many games against each other. They can be fairly evaluated. Whereas, Ohio State not making the playoffs last year, what, what was that based on? It was based on the evaluation of them getting blown out one week, but then they also had better wins than Oklahoma. And then you factor in the whole Notre Dame thing where if they would just join the ACC, that would have been a semifinal game with Clemson, and we could have just had Ohio State and Oklahoma both in it. So it goes on and on, and I don't like to put a Band-Aid on one particular year and say that would fix it, but that would have fixed last year. But just the eight teams with the five conference champions all being included and i really don't care what their record is they play in a vacuum i don't care if they're eight and four they're in the playoff that just so happened that that particular year the conference wasn't great or, or maybe it was just a very good and teams beat up on each other you won a championship you get into the playoffs again at the end of the nfl season nobody's complaining that oh that division's really weak uh, let's leave that champion out of the playoffs yeah, I think it's just a change. You know, when the college football playoffs first started, people, some people didn't like it, some people did. Um, you know how how it goes. People are stuck in what they like, um, and it's going to take a while to change. I don't, I don't think an expansion is going to happen anytime soon. I think they've said that um, already last year when people questioned it. But I, I agree. And then you also take consideration like a team like Notre Dame that doesn't have a conference championship. They have one less game on their schedule. So why do they get more of a, I guess, a bump in the college playoff rankings and other teams that did play in their conference championship? So that brings another question is why do they, why do people put them higher in the rankings? So it, there's a lot of questions. And I feel like a lot of it is personal opinion. Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State, Oklahoma, were all playing for their playoff lives in championship games against really good opponents while Notre Dame was able to sit back and watch the games, and they had the free ride into the playoffs. Now, of course, they earned it based on the regular season, so Notre Dame fans don't jump on me for that, but I'm just saying <laughs> the, 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 the alignment should be the same for everyone. Win a conference if that's the criteria. Um, yeah, I won't go into anything else. Uh, I've I've uh, lost my 18 <laughs> points, but I've stated a zillion times. Yeah, I, I just think that the playoff is better than the bcs i still think it's tainted and it's just i call it a selection process i don't call it a true playoff it's a selection it's a invitational is what it is mm -hmm. it's not a true playoff an objective system but is it better than the bcs yeah just merely that it affords two other worthy opponents two other worthy teams the opportunity to win a national championship that's the only thing that makes it better yeah, and I think also that one thing that I will say that it's not like the BCS is they also factor in uh, those things that we couldn't factor in with the BCS is injuries and who's back, who's not back. You know, if someone um, had a great beginning of the year, but then one of their main stars gets injured and they kind of hobble along towards the end, that's factored in, which I do actually, uh, I do like the fact that they were able to factor in like that. Or, you know, if they're doing you know, they, they, they have one loss in the beginning of the year or the second year and their, you know, star quarterback was injured, but then they're doing well for the rest of the year. That's taken into consideration. So I do like that fact that 
that adds to this that they can mentally say, okay, we can't knock this team because of this. So uh, I do like that. There is a pro and a con to that because the judgment is probably accurate most of the time. Mm-hmm. But if Ohio State's quarterbacks get hurt a game later in 2014 and they don't prove that they can play as well as they did with a third string quarterback, maybe they don't get the nod over TCU and Baylor and they get left out of the playoff and we don't realize that they're the best team that wins the national championship. Yeah, it all comes down to that human error again. Yeah, who knows? All right, Jackie, we appreciate you stopping by. It's a great discussion. Uh, We could go on and on forever talking about playoffs. That's for sure. People love uh, debating it. So uh, you have a great day and I appreciate you uh, joining us. All right. Thank you so much, Mark.